Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the annual lecture 2021. The title of the lecture is Greenwich Park Revealed. And as everybody knows, this is going to be given by Graham Deer and Jane Pelly. Now I'm just going to say a few things about housekeeping. In a moment, when Graham and Jane start, can I ask everybody to mute themselves because that improves reception? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, can you, if you know how to do it, can you also turn off your camera during the presentation itself? Okay. Now, the second thing I'm going to do is just to introduce Graham and Jane. I feel a bit silly doing this because everybody knows who they are. Anyway, Graham Deer um, has been with us for, he's been the manager here at the park for about 12 years. Everybody knows who he is. And um, he's now going to be the programme manager for Greenwich Park Reveal, this big project. I'll answer one question now. Why is it called Greenwich Park Revealed? The answer is because one of the things it aims to do is to reveal something of what Greenwich Park looked like in the 1600s under plans introduced by Charles II. That's the answer to that question. The, Graham is assisted by Jane Kelly, who is usually to be found at headquarters, and she is the Royal Park's head of landscape. Now, there's just one other thing I want to do before we all start away. I want to pay a small tribute to Liz Coyle, who has done so much for Greenwich Park over the last 25 years and who sadly passed away a few weeks ago and can't be with us this evening. So we're now going to hear from Graham and Jane for about 45 minutes and then we follow with some questions. Graham, over to you. Lovely, thanks. Richard and I must say this is a real pleasure for Jane and I to, to speak to the friends this evening. Uh, throughout today Jane and I have been running an orientation day for the new project staff that have just been appointed to help us with the delivery phase of the project um, and it seems really fitting that our, our first act of delivery, uh, this is delivery phase for real, and uh, the first thing that we should do is, is to talk to the friends and say thank you. I mean, in my nearly 12 years at Greenwich Park, I've always had a great deal of support and encouragement from the friends of Greenwich Park. And uh, latterly, a very generous financial gift, um, which you'll have seen in the newsletter, a gift of £50,000 towards um, the delivery phase and, and making this project and this aspiration, this dream, making it real for us. So we're really grateful for that. And uh, this is a nice way for us to be able to say thank you. Um, and what, by, by way of describing the project and give you a bit more information, I'd like to go back to the beginning of the, beginning of the story. Um, um, I love this slide and I love this picture of Greenwich Park because it really puts the park in its setting and you're looking down the grand access across to the Isle of Dogs. Um, and this comes from a drone survey that we did in 2018 looking at uh, archaeological features in that very dry summer we had but I didn't realise that we would get such stunningly beautiful images in the early morning of the park. Um, so why you have a chance to appreciate the view from above a general wall. Um, but where did the story of Green start revealed? It started really with Jane and I were getting our heads together. Is it five years or is it, or is it six years? So it's somewhere around, somewhere around 2016, um, 2015 that we started working on this project. And um, the first project in the park that we worked on together was St Mary's Lodge and landscaping around that and I, I think you all agree that that was a huge improvement 
uh, opening up that the new garden and connecting in it with the herb garden was a real improvement to that gateway um, of St Mary's Lodge. And we had an ongoing project from there on continuing the refurbishment of the playground, which we did over several years. Um, we were casting our eye around the park and looking at the park management plan and saying, what would we like to do next? And we, we both thought, well, the viewpoint of Wolf Statue, which, which is such an iconic view for London uh, and for, for a World Heritage Site, the quality of the landscaping around General Wolf Statue was really awful. Um, had a lot of erosion on, on the ground, ascent, the giant steps and poor cracked paving. So we put together a proposal and we went along and presented it to our executive committee. And I think we were asking for about half a million pounds um, to, to renovate it. And our, our director of projects, Greg McElane, at the time said to us, this, seems like, this sounds like a, a lottery bid. And um, we had to go away and think about that. And I thought, well, I think what he's just said is, no, you can't have the money, but if you can raise some about, um, for a bigger project, we might consider match funding it. And that's where it really all started. We went back to the park management plan and we, and it was a bit of a luxury, really, to look across the park and say, well, if we had the money, what would we really do and what needs doing on this park? Uh, and um, fortunately, the Heritage Lottery Fund um, at the time were running a grant scheme called Parks for People. So they had a substantial funding just for the improvement of um, parks. Uh, and the Royal Parks did have a track record of successful Heritage Funds, Parks for People's bids. They were just finishing a project at Brompton Cemetery. They had um, projects at Bushy Park and Richmond Park. So we, we started to put together a proposal um, in 2017. But as, as most of you will probably know, it was a two stage process. We had to put an initial application, get around one class, and then we were, we were awarded development phase funding. And we took nearly two years to work up the development phase. And we submitted that bid for uh, 10, 10 and a half million pounds in August of 2019. And we, we were waiting for a decision in December. And uh, the decision in December was, yes, we'll give you the money. And we were awarded a four and a half million pound grant for a 10 and a half million pound scheme. Um, but th then, um, so this just reiterating what I've said there, here's the, um, the master plan for the project, which I don't think it's not very easy to read to see that the projects associated with the, um, with the bid actually cover the whole park. But as, as I've said, it's a four and a half million pound grant. Um, you, you'll notice that the text there says an eight million project, and, and that was the, the spanner in the works really for Greenwich Park. Um, revealed back in um, March of 2020. Um, but we got the support and funding from the Royal Parks because the park, the project really is delivering all of the Royal Parks of objectives and or delivers on all of our values. And we also had to tick, hit outcome targets for the Heritage Fund. We had to demonstrate that our project was delivering um, for heritage and for people and community. And we did that successfully. We got so we got the round two pass in December, and we started advertising our recruitment advertising in the March of 2020. Um, but then, uh, then we had we even launched it. We had a launch event. And I can see some of the Friends Committee in that launch event there. This was in January 2020. Um, I, I, I'm sure you're there. I think you're there somewhere, Richard. Um, and this shows you the depth, the, 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 and some of our volunteers, some of the friends volunteers, uh, and this is a collection of people that, that directly or indirectly supported or helped us prepare the bid uh, over four years. Um, but then um, we all know what happened in March 2020, everything came to a standstill. Um, and for the park, as you, you will know, that meant closing the road and closing the playgrounds and closing the tennis courts, um, very much in, in lockdown. Um, and that really put the brakes on the project because uh, roughly 70 to 80 percent of the Royal Park's income is externally raised through events, through filming, through licensing, through catering, through car parking. 
and um, like lots of organisations, uh, um, our income streams just stopped. Um, and we'd, we'd advertise, we'd, we'd put the, we were just about to press the button on advertising at the green light, and within a couple of days, the adverts were pulled, all the recruitment was frozen, um, and the, the whole project went went into stasis um, for a few months whilst um, the nation and the organisation looked to see what the outcome or the, um, was going to be of the pandemic. Um, and the Royal Parks as a charity were in a good position. We had um, lots of reserves and it had been well managed. So we were able to ride the storm to a certain extent, but immediately there was a large capital programme and the whole capital programme was, was pulled. Um, not just Greenwich Park, all the spending was reduced and restricted until we, we knew what was going to happen with the future. Um, and it didn't pan out too well in 2020. There were no major, um, 2020, no major events. And we're still feeling the impacts into 2021. And some of you will, will know, know our two largest events for generating income are summer concerts in Hyde Park and Winter Wonderland. Uh, the second year running, there are no summer concerts. It's going to be a much, much reduced winter wonderland. And unlike 2020, there is no insurance, contractual insurance payout this year. Uh, large, no one will insure a large event anymore. So um, we're, we're still feeling the effects of, of, of loss of income. But um, back in this, um, Jane and I were then challenged, probably in mid 2020, to cut the budget because it was clear that the Royal Parks would no longer be able to match fund five and a half million pounds for this project. And we were told, well, you need to realistically make a substantial cut. Um, and so we, we looked at it and we realized that there was really only about 20 capital projects and then trying to top slice a small amount of money off of 20 projects really was not going to work. Um, we had to look at the large capital items to make a substantial saving. Um, and we did that and we saved, we had to cut two and a half million from the budget, which is why we've ended up with an eight million pound project. But as, as we say, explain later, I think actually the outcome for us is probably a positive one. And the changes that we've made, um, as it turns out, are quite beneficial. Um, and it would, I ought to really just mention what happened. Um, see the slide above, we can show you the empty car park, and the, which was the immediate effect of closing the, um, the park. But um, you are mostly, I'm sure, or all of you, um, local residents, and you will know what happened. The phenomenon of, of, of lockdown um, for open spaces, how valuable they became to the local community, despite the fact that 30% of our visitors had usually come by car and 20% of our visitors, uh, overseas visitors. Um, last year, the park was busier than ever and people came by bike and people walked in uh, or, or some of them came on the, the, the public transport, but we were busier than ever and the park was used in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. People, it's interesting, you look at that photo and you can see between great groups, people are social distancing and walking up through the park this evening and then there's people out picnicking and enjoying um, groups uh, and friends getting together. Um, there's no social distancing within the groups, but between the groups there is still, which is quite interesting. The other phenomenon is the, the, the age. Um, um, we did a quick survey last summer to try and capture some data. I mean, the average age of visitors uh, is, is 10 to 15 years lower as well, which is very interesting because some of our target audiences for the project um, and our visitor number targets, which were, weren't actively developed project to increase visitor numbers, but we, 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 were, we were managing the, the increase that was going to happen anyway because of population rise in London and especially in East London. But that increase in visitor numbers has happened really before the park has, the project has even got started. Um, but some ways we think we, that's something that we perhaps need to try and capitalise on. There is a new audience using the park and we have to understand what they want to, to do. And if there are some behavioural challenges, then we need to manage that. But in December, it was, yeah, about December the 14th in 2020, we had to go back to our board of trustees 
for permission to progress with the budget. So we went back with a budget a project proposal for an eight million pound project. The board of trustees agreed to fund it, which was a brave decision because, as you can see, going into twenty one, our finances are still not back um, to uh, uh, back to normal. And, and crucially, the heritage fund recognised the value of the project and the position that we were in. And they've agreed to fund this to the same level. So we're still getting four and a half million pounds from Heritage Fund. Uh, we've got the go ahead and it's taken us a few months of, of, of to sort out recruitment. And, and we'll come on to the changes, the capital changes that we made. Um, so you can understand how we've had to adjust to reduce that, to, to meet that new budget. And what has Greenwich Park revealed, revealed it, 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 it's, it's about, as Richard said, it's partly about restoring uh, and revealing the hidden history of, of Greenwich Park. And Greenwich Park, um, as you see that aerial photo, it gives you an idea of why it's so important. It's the highest ground overlooking the Bending River. You have the, the river to the north and the Roman road to the south. Uh, and where, where else can you go to, a, to what's essentially an urban park? And you can be in the Eastern hemisphere and see a Roman temple or walk across the Meridian line into the Western Hemisphere and see uh, an Anglo-Saxon cemetery, two scheduled ancient monuments, and you have a, 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 a history that, that spans all the way up to um, the, the, the 21st century. Um, and you can see um, Charles II there um, at the restoration of the monarchy was really a key point for the park and um, the new landscaping of the park, which we'll touch on later, and Wren's Flamsteed House, which um, one of our first acts on, on the project uh, in this February, after we got the go ahead from our board of trustees, was to remove um, three trees from Castle Hill to open up the lost view of um, Flamsteed House. So that was our first reveal, if, if you, you like. Um, and, the, the restoration of this historic landscape really is a key element of the project. Um, so really, uh, we're taking the story back to 1660 and um, Charles II um, was back on the throne and to landscape the park was a, a real statement, a real statement of the role to being back and back in business. Um, and he'd seen the work that um, Louis the 15th, 14th, 14th, where am I? 14th, thank you, um, was, was doing in France um, in, at Vaux Vicomte and then subsequently in Versailles. And you can see the image on the left hand side mm -hmm. and it, showing a very similar layout to that of Greenwich Park. Um, and he was working with a very famous architect, Lenotre. And Greenwich Park is the only example of this type of classic French design in the UK. Um, and you can see the second image on the left was the design of the parterre, never fully implemented, but you can see the shapes of the parterre banks um, across the, the foot of the, the Grand Ascent. Um, and you can see how that very strong um, formation of avenues, the sort of duck's foot formation, has been retained throughout history. You can see that through the, the ages, 1703, then in the Soyuz plan of 1850. And still today, that forms the, the basis and the structure um, of the park. And that's something that's really quite hidden. Uh, people don't, aren't aware of that. They aren't aware of the importance of the, the design and its great importance in landscape history. Um, so moving on, Graham. Yeah, the, the, what's so visually striking about Greenwich, I think, the, the two, two things for me that make it different and, and different and it's that, uh, from all of the other royal parks or, or most of them, is this, this, this pattern of avenues of trees um, that you have across the site. It's such a key feature of the park and the fact that you have the level change from, from top to bottom. Um, and really a key element of, of, of the project is um, the restoration and maintenance of those avenues of trees. If you look at the image on the um, right-hand side, you can see the coloured avenues 
Those are the avenues in the park that we currently that we'll be concentrating on restoring as part of the project. And most of the reason why we need to work on, on those is because of pests and diseases. And we're really suffering from this globalization of trade uh, and a, and a um, consequence of that is a globalization of pests and diseases. Um, so the, you can see the image on the left-hand side. This is, um, this is from Arbitrack, our tree management system. Uh, and we do a tree health check. Uh, um, so this part here, going down to the Boating Lake to Park Road Gate, see the colour coding on those trees there. This is an avenues of beech and turkey oak. So the healthy trees, the trees in good condition, are the orange ones. Um, mostly plain trees, large plain trees there. Um, the ones in blue are in okay condition. And the ones that are black are in poor condition. Um, really, most of the poor condition down, down, down there is, is due to squirrel damage. Those trees were replanted in the, the, the Silver Jubilee in 77. Uh, you can see there's big gaps there. Tree establishment in this park is difficult. Sand and gravel, dry soils. Normally, if you were doing a contract to, uh, for um, establishment maintenance of tree plantings, you would have uh, an aftercare contract for two or three years. We find if you can you can water trees for up to seven or eight years, and then if you get a drought in the ninth year in the spring, you can still lose the trees. So it does need a lot of aftercare. You've been poor establishment down there. Um, but what was also poor is there was, say it quietly, there was no squirrel control. So there's been a lot of damage to those trees um, some of them are so poorly stunted they'll never make uh, a, a good shaped tree others appear to be appear to be healthy but where they've been ring, ring barked as the trees grow and they get more top heavy the tops blow out of them so there's a little bit of a risk or danger there but it also means that the, the tops of the trees will continue to blow out and they won't get a good a good um, tree shape and they're also poor species choice the, the beech and turkey oak um, are much to squirrels liking and unfortunately for the last several years we've had infestations of oak processionary moth um, which is a, a, a new moth caterpillar that's coming from the continent um, produces webs uh, cat of caterpillars in the canopy that come down to the ground to pupate but they're very hairy and you get a very aggressive um, rash infection um, from the from the hairs of those not just people but dogs and animals as well. So we, we actually use biological control. We, we have to spray those oak trees and, and most of the oak trees in the park now, we have to spray every spring with a bacterial solution to control and we can never get rid of all, all the nests. Um, that's a, a real problem. Um, and then other, the, the trees, some of the avenue trees are just unfortunately, they're under onslaught. The, the Blackheath Avenue, which is roughly 360 trees of, of horse chestnut since 2000 have been infected by a bacterial disease called bleeding canker. Uh, it, it, it physically blocks the conducting vessels in the trees and the trees die of drought. And if you were to walk today to walk down Blackheath Avenue and to look at the crown of the trees, you will see almost every other tree is dying back at the crown. There's no cure for it. And we are faced that within sometime within the next 20, or 30 years, most of those trees will be dead. Um, we had originally uh, envisaged clear felling and replanting that whole avenue, but we decided that was too many trees. The rate of loss was perhaps slower than we, we first feared. Um, we're losing two to 3% a year. So our strategy there is to wait until 40% of the trees have gone, and then we will fell and replant. Interestingly, if you, if you look at aerial photos, from the 1940s, you will see that that was an avenue of horse chestnut that looked reasonably complete in 1945, but in 1946, the whole lot was completely replanted. So we know that avenue dates from 19, 1946. You would expect those trees to live average age for horse chestnut, 120 years. So these ones are, um, 80 years old, um, they're, they're not very big for the size, it's a challenging soil to grow in. Um, 
but they, they're not going to live 120 years. So we do need to replant sometime in the not too distant future. What's also very heartbreaking is the sweet chestnut um, uh, and now inf it been becoming infected with uh, a fungal disease called Phytophthora, the soil borne fungus. Um, and that causes this um, die back to the trees and we get characteristic staining in the timber and it's called ink stain disease. Uh, and that seems to be very aggressive. We had localized infections of Phytophthora remorum at the back of the um, Pavilion Cafe for the last 10 to 15 years, but we were only losing one or two trees a year, but it seems to have migrated onto Great Cross Avenue and Bower Avenue, and um, they are declining at an alarming rate. Again, if you, if you walk down Bower Avenue, Great Cross Avenue, look up into the cap, crown, and we are losing the majority of the trees, young and old, are infected and suffering from Phytophthora. Um, and it may be 20 or 30 years before we've lost all of those as well. So we're now having to adjust our tree strategy to look at um, Bower Avenue. It really is quite heartbreaking. If that wasn't bad enough, um, two years ago, we, 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 we got Oriental Chestnut Gore wasp from the continent as well. And that's a gall wasp that infects the, the leaves and the buds of sweet chestnut. All of the trees in the park at sweet chestnut are now infected. And that's affecting the vigour of the, the tree. And that's something that it didn't need. And if we wanted the triple whammy, there's a disease called chestnut blight on the continent. And they're losing a lot of chestnuts on the continent to chestnut blight. It's not in the country. Well, we have two trees in the park that are infected with chestnut blight. Uh, and they will be removed and burned on site. We can no longer chip um, or, um, or take any timber off the site that is sweet chestnut. It has to stay on the site, we can't transport it. Uh, and that's um, probably tree stock that came in from the continent a few years ago, um, and it's being monitored by Forestry Commission. And the bottom slide shows you the typical tree squirrel damage that we do. So restoring the avenues is as absolutely fundamentally a key thing that we need to address as part of Greenwich Park Rebuild, because if we do nothing in the next 20, 30 years, very substantial parts of the park's avenues will be gone. And the reason Greenwich Park is part of the World Heritage Site is for this amazing Baroque landscape that, that Jane um, mentioned. Um, and over to Jane for the... Yeah, so, so at the heart of the, the, the grand design and the access that runs through the park um, is the grand ascent. And these giant steps, as they were known, um, were originally shown in engravings, uh, in engravings with 12 steps. Um, and those became nine. And as you know, nowadays, we, we have the, the six giant steps and, and the seven risers. Um, and we have been working really closely with Historic England and they are really, really supportive of the idea of restoring this uh, in all its glory to sharpen up the parterre banks um, and to really create that frame for the steps and to remove the diagonal path that cuts into those banks at the bottom. Um, so this is uh, working really closely with Historic England and our archaeologists to shaping up these steps. Um, and the top three, it's a case of recreating them. We believe that they were removed when they put in the Clock Hill Path in the 1760s, I believe. Um, and so that'll be reconstructing those top steps um, to accommodate the viewing platform at the top. So um, clearly the, the wolf statue and the platform around wolf is the sort of beating heart of the World Heritage Site, but it really is uh, quite shabby. The paving's broken. There's a huge amount of erosion you can see there at the top of the slope. Um, and it's not fully accessible for people with, uh, who are in wheelchairs or have mobility issues. So the idea is to resurface, to pull that platform out slightly and create a more dramatic slope uh, so that people will be contained by the, 
the, uh, the balcony and the rail at the front, and then to remove uh, six car parking spaces and to pull the, the, um, the plaza type area back and to frame that with a, a new pair of kiosks. Um, so on the right hand side, we'd have a new catering kiosk and on the left, a store to match that can open up. Um, it'll be a shelter and then we can have uh, cafe furniture stored there um, and create a really nice space for people to sit, enjoy the view um, and really enhance that, that viewing space and the circulation and, and the quality of that plaza. Um, close by the Pavilion Cafe, at the moment you may all be aware that there's a store that's been um, a temporary store, and I don't know how many years it's been there, um, in one of our really important historic avenues. Um, so we looked very carefully at different options for moving that store. Um, and the idea is to create a small store to the south of the existing pavilion. It'll have um, a green roof and it'll be uh, covered with planters. But really to make the, the cafe function effectively, uh, an external store is required and we'll be looking at enhancing the garden around the cafe to create a really much higher quality space for seating and immediately outside the cafe um, and to really create a, a quality environment and enhance the, enhance the experience for people who visit the cafe. Time lag. Oh, I thought I was ahead of your time lag there. No, no time lag. The flower garden? Yeah, the flower garden. Uh, so this project is a really unique opportunity to, to look at the quality of, of the horticulture in the flower garden. Um, the postcard on the left is a lovely Edwardian postcard mm -hmm. which shows the quality of those herbaceous borders at that time. So we'll have the opportunity and lots of volunteer opportunities as well to work over the four, four years um, to enhance the quality of that horticulture, to open up views, um, to refresh some of the more jaded and overgrown evergreen shrubberies, and to look at the lake and raise the level of the water so that it becomes visible, so that we create much better marginal and aquatic habitat in the lake for wildlife and to enhance the water quality by bringing borehole um, water to the lake and allowing it to flush through so that the water is more oxygenated um, with a nice fountain in it to really draw the eye to that as a feature. And a project that I know is very dear to the heart of Clive, if, if Clive <laughs> is um, listening, um, is the renovation and electrification of the mm -hmm. Bad stand, um, which will be one of the first things that we'll aim to do with the project. Uh, there's not there's not a huge amount of um, refurbishment to do on the the band stand itself. There's some some of the soffits uh, need replacing, and the, the 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 drainage from the roof actually comes down on the the columns, but they they need rodding and clear clearing out, and the whole thing needs refreshing and repainting. What we want to do is um, try to investigate the original paint colours. So we'll take paint samples and see what the original paint colours. I, I don't know if this paint scheme is the original paint scheme. Unfortunately, photographically, if we go back to the Edwardian postcards, of course, they're all black and white. It doesn't help. So if anybody out there has some uh, colour photographs, and I, I don't know when, I'm sorry, maybe someone can tell us on chat when colour photography came in. Um, if we had any colour photography, that would really help. Um, but we'll be taking paint samples and try to discover what the original paint um, paint colour was. It would be nice to go for some authenticity. And as as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the uh, one of the consequences of the budget cut was reducing our proposals for a new um, learning centre. We were um, building a two and a half million pound learning centre and community space in the nursery yard and opening up half of the nursery yard as new public space. This was the largest capital item 
in the whole project. And if we had to make a substantial saving, it was the only place where we could make that saving. So we had to take a long, hard look at it and say, well, how can we still deliver our objectives for improving our education facilities at a much cheaper and more reasonable budget? And I think we've come up with a solution that has lots of positive benefits to it, um, not least of actually, in terms of new build footprint, is substantially reduced, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, and we had a look, we, we originally rejected the old wildlife centre, which is currently used as the education space, and, and the friends use it for their, um, for their open days on, on a Saturday. And we rejected that as a, could we build an extension to it? It just wasn't suitable. Um, the roof is too low. You would have to take the roof off and build, build up. It has no damp proof. It wasn't suitable. But then we looked at it and said, well, could we build a smaller classroom facility in part of the deer park, um, but use the old wildlife centre for the back of house facilities? So for the storage facility, for the toilet facilities, could we retain those in the older building and build a new building, um, sustainable building using uh, um, green building practices for something that would have a low carbon footprint. And that's what we've done. So it's a very open structure, timber framed with a grass roof using an air source heat pump to, to heat it. And um, one of the things that we think will really, in some ways really enhances the education offer. Um, there's this part of the deer park um, behind the wildlife centre. Um, it was only opened up to the deer when the wildlife centre was, was converted. Uh, about 20 years ago and before that the deer had been excluded from that area and we did think well if we excluded the deer from that area and gave that that meadow area um, just over as a learning space and created the new education pond in that location then we'd have all the habitats and all the resources we want to use for that for, for environmental education in one place where the classroom is um, and that's what we're, we're going to do um, as you know, one of the consequences of doing that building is the deer are going to go on a holiday. Um, so the herd will be moved to Richmond Park in August of, of this year. Uh, um, whilst we have building work going on in the deer park and in the nursery yard, the deer are very sensitive to, to loud noises and disturbance. And our, our, our vet advisor said they really should be moved. And um, when they return, it will just be a herd of fallow deer, which is the historic herd historically from, from the um, 15th century up until the 1960s. It was only fallow. The red only came in in the 1960s. So we'll go back to a fallow herd. We'll have a larger fallow herd. Um, we are creating a new bit of deer park by, not, by removing some redundant shed buildings um, to the south of the nursery yard. And we are allowing the deer access to some of the woodland area. So I mean, much better for their welfare. They'll have some cover at the moment when they're in calf, they only have some nettle beds. Um, and the fact that they're going on holiday for a, a couple of years, they will come back in the summer of 2023, does mean that we can do some really um, exciting habitat restoration work on, on the um, deer park meadows themselves. First catch your deer. Um, the other main area of, of, of development is in the nursery yard at the Van Brigade entrance. Mm, yeah, so um, this is a really fantastic opportunity to create a really um, strongly focused community area. Um, we know that, that most of the local community coming in use the Van Brigade for, for dog walking and accessing the park. So the idea is to open up that view as you come through the gate um, so that you can see through to the lodge where we'll be creating a really nice small cafe. And to the rear of that, a community garden, you can see some raised beds and a new uh, greenhouse there. So we'll be looking to provide training and, and horticultural volunteering for small groups there. And you'll see the um, tool shed is going to be converted into some public toilets and a changing uh, places uh, toilet facility, which has a hoist, um, a bench and um, toilet facilities for people uh, with special needs. 
and then we'll be pushing back the boundary between the yard uh, to create a bigger public space for meeting, reusing some nice timber circular seats, and really creating a, a, a place, if you like, where people can meet, where we can have small events, uh, where we could have possible exhibitions or where our volunteers can meet and greet people. Um, and in the machine shed, you can see that there'll be some new solar panels on the roof there. And we'll be able to use that to store our mobility buggy and to store um, collections of park artifacts, which we hope to be able to use for a handling collection for, um, for educational visits um, and store other materials. So, oh, and I forgot to mention the community orchard as well to the rear of the garden. So that would be a, a lovely heritage varieties orchard um, with a wild flower meadow. So it's really increasing our capacity to accommodate um, our horticultural volunteers. And we know there's a huge demand uh, down in the orchard. So I think this will be a really lovely complementary facility. Um, the, I don't the, know if you want to say any more. But the, the Banbury Yard is, is a real cornerstone <laughs> of the whole project. What we're trying to do is create a new visit, a, a new visitor hub for local park users away from Pavilion Cafe and the Wolf Statue viewpoint. The Pavilion Cafe cannot cope with the number of visitors. We did look, in, in early days, we did, we did look to see if it was possible to extend the Pavilion Cafe, but it was just prohibitively exp expensive. So by creating a new hub, <coughs> new toilet facilities and cafe facilities near the flower garden, um, where there already is a local audience uh, and a very busy gate at Bamber Gate. We hope to redirect some of the visitor pressure for, to there, relieve pressure on the Pavilion Cafe. And, and, I, and I expect that the, the Bamber Cafe, which will, it's, it's not a big building, it, it's not going to be a big full cafe hot meal offer, um, but it would be a great place to go for coffee and tea and cakes. Yeah, so. Um... Our, um, we're also going to be focusing our energies on, on One Tree Hill. Um, this is actually the early viewpoint in the park. A lot of the early engravings and, and um, paintings show the view from One Tree Hill before the observatory became, became a thing. And we're looking at improving access to renew the seat and the viewpoint at the top of the hill. Uh, and to do some work on habitat enhancement. Um, so really to create a new focal point in the park uh, that is more accessible um, and with enhanced habitat. Okay. And then finally, at the end, um, and this will be one of the last things we will be doing, is to looking, look at the Blackheath Gate uh, entrance. At the moment, all the, the hordes of visitors who get dropped off by coaches have to walk through a car park as they come into the park. Um, so what we want to do is remove that car park, bring the avenues right down to the, to the gate and create a really nice space that people can walk into. They immediately are in the park uh, there'll be an information board um, and there'll be a really nice place for people to, to start their journey in the park and also look at bringing the flower garden entrance slightly forward uh, and enhancing views into the flower garden and encouraging people to, to turn right and take that walk through the flower garden. I can pose a question there for some, some keen-eyed keen-eyed observers might be able to spot, I don't know if you can see my arrow there, can you see that arrow? Yes. Yeah. You, you might be able to spot that what looks like a pink granite fountain there. Um, and we said part of the project we want to do is restore the drinking fountains, but um, we don't think it's a very good idea to have a drinking fountain that's situated in a car park. Um, so we need to find the best location for the pink granite fountain. Um, so we are open to ideas on that one. Um, okay. But the park is, is uh, it's a really important, when we went out to consultation, what came back very strongly was biodiversity. And um, these two maps um, 
show you in colour coding the changes that we made to the mowing regimes in the park. And it was a very simple thing to do. Um, actually saved us um, nearly nearly £10,000 a year in, in, in mowing costs and has real biodiversity benefits. So on the left, you have the existing grassland regimes. So the light blue is the areas that traditionally have been treated as a meadow, a meadow cut. So it's Crooms Hill and um, below Wolf Statue and on One Tree Hill. And that's just cut once, once a year. All the rest of the red area um, was what we call a parkland cut and it's cut twice a week between um, March and um, October. Uh, I have some photos in my office dating from 1997 and they show in 1997, not that long ago, the whole park would have been red. The whole park was cut and parkland cut. And the advantage of the meadow cut is it, it allows butterflies like the small copper um, to, to go through its life cycle and, and breed and multiply. And it allows flowers like harebell, which have disappeared from the park, but you do still get on Blackheath um, to, to survive. Um, so you get a lot more invertebrates through it. Uh, so on the right hand side, you can see the changes that we made last year. Uh, we changed the mowing regime and we increased the amount of um, meadow cut. We more than doubled it. Um, and interestingly, um, for me, I will walk around the park and I think it looks a lot more semi-natural, a lot more like a, more like a country park than, a, than an urban or amenity park. Um, but actually, I didn't, we made that change last year. Uh, I didn't get a single comment in my email box at all. For me, I think it makes the whole areas of the park look more, more natural. And um, we've set up a butterfly train set. Some of you will know Joe Beale, um, the local naturalist, um, bird watcher and entomologist. So we commissioned um, Joe last year to do um, a butterfly transect across the whole park um, as a baseline before we made the mowing changes. And then we would repeat that in 2024 with, with Joe and we'll do some additional monitoring with volunteers in 21, 22, 23 um, to see what changes there are in the butterfly population as a result of our change in the mowing regime. Mm -hmm. And what we hope that we will see is the populations and distributions of butterflies like the small copper and the small heap and the meadow brown and the ringlet and the marbled white, they should increase, um, which would be a, a, a really positive uh, uh, achievement for biodiversity. Um, other, mes other sustainable messages, um, sustainab sustainable, I don't know measures. What is. measures, thank you. Um, thanks, Jane. Measures that we want to introduce um, is more recycling. Um, again, this is, a, this is a photo to illustrate what happened last summer in the pandemic. Uh, lots more visitors, a lot, young, lot more younger visitors, lots more pizzas, lots more bottles of, and, and cans. And we have actually, by putting out new bins um, and larger bins, increased our recycling, uh, but more than doubled our, well, more than trebled our recycling. Um, but our, our waste has also gone up threefold as well. Um, I know I'm quite aware that these um, domestic style wheelie bins are not very attractive, but we have substantially reduced the numbers of bins in the park whilst increasing the capacity. And we do need to find, we, we are, um, Jane's landscape colleagues will be designing some bin covers so we have a more attractive, more heritage looking cover for these bins, but we absolutely do need that increased capacity because our visitor numbers are going up and our um, waste is going up. One thing that also came back in consultation was uh, we want more drinking fountains uh, and we have two redundant Victorian uh, granite fountains in, in the park, um, one halfway down the rustic fountain down Lovers Walk and the pink granite fountain in the car park um, and we intend to get those both into um, back into use. All right. Yeah, good, thanks. Um, visitor dispersal, we, in 20, um, we are mapping the visitors. One of the objectives is to try and move visitors around the park. And uh, this is a heat map on the right-hand side, which shows we use volunteers to map on an instant of where the visitors are distributed around the park. So you can see the main red areas, the two, the three busiest areas are the playground, the pavilion cafe, 
and the wolf statue viewpoint. And you can also see which paths are the busiest paths as well. And um, what we should see when we re when we do this survey again in 2024 is that is that hopefully we'll see a big red red spot near Vanbra Gate and around the Vanbra Cafe and the community garden as we distribute visitors there. We are trying to move people to the viewpoints and to get people to appreciate the new viewpoints at One Tree Hill and at Croons Hill as well. And the, the project really is very much not just, I mean, it's a great historic landscape and we've got a duty to, um, to look after that and maintain that for future generations. But the park is about people uh, and that's what it's for. Uh, the funding from, is, is jointly from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the National Lottery Community Fund. So we have an activity plan which is being delivered by Helen, um, our um, Partnership and Community Engagement Officer, and we've just recruited our community archaeologist, chap called Andrew Mayfield, I'm sure some of you will get to meet over the next three years, and we were running training and volunteering projects, uh, we will be improving interpretation. Um, there is a number programme of events over the next four years to, to bring heritage to life, uh, to, we're promoting health and well-being by having um, health walks, and we'll be working in partnerships with an, a number of other providers to deliver um, projects for us. Um, we're, we're phasing different types of activities in each year. So this year we are um, prioritising youth events and activities and youth theatre and our partner is Tramshed. Um, next year we'll be putting out a contract to, um, to, to concentrate on dance related activities and in the third year we'll be working on, on more arts orientated activities similar to um, Grange and Auckland's arts um, festival um, and we have target audiences for the for the project and, and our target audience audiences were some groups that um, based on our initial surveys uh, and our Ipsos Nori surveys we saw that um, black and ethnic minorities uh, and refugee groups were underrepresented. Our, our average age um, is quite high as visitors to the park and, and we were told certainly the 16 to 40, 24 year olds were underrepresented. Actually that's changed. If you walked around the park this evening you would see that substantially um, the whole audience of younger people coming to use the parks and interesting that was one of our target audiences and we're getting a more ethnically diverse um, group of visitors to, to the parks as well. So in some ways we've achieved all of our targets without doing anything. Um, but we also want to um, make the park more accessible. Very difficult when you've got nearly a 50 metre drop difference between the top and the bottom, but we are running the mobility scheme. We've had a petrol mobility buggy for a few years as a trial and we are looking, we're just putting out a, a, a tender to acquire our own electric vehicle and we'll be wanting to recruit volunteers to help us to run that scheme. And we had some target wards where we're targeting with areas of deprivation and trying to encourage people from those areas that may not be visiting the park to visit the park. And we have a men's, men's health walk running um, with um, CACT, the um, Charlton Athletic uh, Community. Community Trust, thank you. Um, so we're working with CACT um, on a number of pro projects. Um, we're, really, we're really trying to, the, the project is really about providing opportunities for young people. Our grounds contractors already runs an apprenticeship scheme, but we found that the, the average age of people coming to the apprenticeship scheme wasn't really school leavers. So we now work in the Bankside Open Station Trust to provide eight um, shorter term uh, pre-apprenticeships where people get a qualification, they get a chance to try out Culture and see if it's a career that is for them. And I'm really pleased that actually, as of today, our pre-apprentice from last year, a chap called Jake, um, is now starting a three-year apprenticeship um, with Gavin Jones in Greenwich Park. So that's a real success story. Um, and we have a target for volunteers. We'll be running career taster days with some of our contractors 
so that um, young people can find out what is it like to be a landscape contractor or what is it like to be a tree um, a tree contractor uh, uh, so we very much want people to to demonstrate what opportunities there are to work in the real, royal park what uh, opportunities there are to work in in um, in recreation and leisure generally um, we're running some family activity days um, some natural history workshops with the Field Studies Council, and um, we really want to look at in the, the playground. How do we encourage families to play in the park and not just play in the playground? Uh, that because the the playground has been a victim of success and a, a wonderful um, natural landscape in in the playground, but you can get six, seven hundred people at one time in that playground, and it's full, uh, and it's getting busier. So we really, um, we're working with London Play um, to try to encourage people to see the whole park as their, their playground and, and not just the formal play equipment. Community archaeology, uh, again, many of you will know, you, you'll know Graham Keeble that we've worked with, with several years. Um, we've run community archaeology projects. This is the photographs from the project in 2019, which we did on the air raid shelter down in front of the Queen's house. We found that lead soldier in the air raid shelter and of course that happens in Greenwich Park um, I always say with Greenwich Park if you dig a hole you dig a hole you find archaeology we also from that same location found a stone arrowhead as as well so uh, there's a sort of 3,000 years of history at least there um, and whilst we're working on the air raid shelter we had a couple that came along that said their parents used to use that air raid shelter and they said this is what happens um, with Greenwich Park, um, the, the locals' memories go back a long way. This is a, some of the events that we'll be running. Um, so you can see, uh, as, a, as, an in, as an addition to the Friends Bandstand concerts, which you, you run so well in July and August, we will be running two world music uh, concerts on, on, on Saturdays or bank holidays. And, we, we trialled to in 2019, we had uh, Shatla Shalik, uh, Salik, um, uh, Bangladeshi band, really good quality musicians, and Mozzie Kondi from um, Guinea, um, so really good musicians, and it's something of a different flavour for maybe a, a slightly different audience. We've got a, a family sing-along cinema. So that should be interesting. And we're supporting the London Wide Car Free Day. So each September over the next four years, there'll be a car free day and activities organized by Tramshed. Uh, and we're really trying to attract the younger audience into the park um, for that day. Possibly we'll, we'll, we'll have a parkour demonstration. Perhaps we might put up a, a temporary skate park in the car park on that day. Um, we have some theatre. And 2019, um, again, Tramshed, they uh, ran a, a small uh, perambulatory theatre on the life of Na Ignatius Sancho. Sancho. Um, and it was really popular. And they're now going to build that up into Ignatius, the community opera. So I look forward to that in, in 2022. As I said, we do dance projects in 22 and 23. Uh, and looking at a, a Greenwich Fair, a recreation um, or a moderated Greenwich Fair, the old Greenwich Fair that was banned in Victorian times because it became too rowdy and disreputable. That's not what we're aiming to recreate, but maybe some of the fun of the fair and a bit of celebration of the project in 2024. Uh, I've mentioned the mobility buggy. Um, and we're, we're timed up, are we? Um, yeah. We're nearly at the end. Presentation. Yes, we are. So, um, yeah, I think a uh, big interpretation project. Um, we've got a fascinating history and we need to tell people about it. So this is the, the programme in brief. This year, main capital projects for this year is, is looking, is, is getting the team in place and doing the detailed design. Um, we'll try to get the electrification to the bandstand and, and improve the electrical supply to the cafe. Then we move on to One Tree Hill and Bamber Lodge in the uh, winter of... Um, 2022 uh, look at the flower garden lake the bandstand renovations should be complete by may of next year and then 2023 is the big 
the big landscape restoration works on the party of banks and the grand ascent we will have the new learning center in the in the deer park and the the final bit of the capital works is is the wolf statue area and the wolf statue kiosk and then finally blackheath gate and um, this is thomas rollinson's famous uh, cartoon of tumbling down one tree hill um, and i think sometimes it's felt a little bit like that getting greenwich park rebuilt off the off the ground but I'm, I'm i'm delighted that we are where we are today and we've inducted our new staff today and speaking to you and it's now real and um, you will see changes a lot of design development over the next six months but come next winter and spring you'll start to see some of the works on the ground and hopefully um, with lifting the COVID restrictions some of the activity and the events at the end of this summer so thank you and any questions Richard? Graham thank you very much for packing so much into your talk and Jane thank you very much um, now the wonders of technology allow you Graham and Jane sitting in the park office to be in touch with me in darkest Kidbrook and with Tina and Stephen Chalicum who are down in Greenwich to link up on questions. So if people have got questions, I hope some of them have come onto the chat box and Stephen is probably going to uh, uh, manage the next part of this uh, this evening. We have an audience of about 150 out there, wow. believe it or not. Wow. And I'd like to have lots and lots of questions coming in. So go ahead, Stephen. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard. A and uh, Graham, actually, if you stop share, um, that'll just allow us to see more people uh, now. Um, I got there's a few questions which have come in. Uh, um, one of those is about the the uh, trees. Um, is Greenwich Park the only park which is uh, affected by this blight, or is it all the uh, parks, the Royal Parks? And, and linked to that, um, with the avenues, it's not just uh, the trees, but the variety of, of trees. Can you tell us uh, uh, that you must try and protect against the, the blight in the future? Could you just uh, uh, um, perhaps address those two? Yeah, well, sweet chestnut blight is a disease that's, um, that's um, prevalent in southern Europe. We have two trees in Greenwich Park that are infected, and there is also half a dozen trees in Hyde Park, uh, and that's being monitored by um, Forestry um, Commission, um, but they don't seem to be aggressive and they're quite young trees. The big problem for the sweet chestnut population in Greenwich Park is the Phytophthora soil-borne fungus. Mm -hmm. That at the moment is a much bigger problem than the chestnut blight. Uh, in terms of what we need to do when we replant the avenues, is we need to have a broader, broader range of species. If we look to all the avenues in, in the park, the only ones that are really in, what I would say is in good condition are the limes. But it would be foolish to replant all of the avenues eventually with lime. If we get at some time in the future, a disease of lime, then we've lost, we've lost the lot. And this isn't something new. I mean, we all remember Dutch elm disease, from the 1960s and 1970s. We've been there before. It's just with our, 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 our global economy, um, we're getting more and more um, diseases come in and the, there's a real move uh, to look at what we call biosecurity to control future infestations and future infections. But it is really difficult. Anyone that's a gardener will know that we're getting more and more pests and diseases of garden plants. Um, whether it's roses or box or, or, or um, it, it just seems to be never ending. And that's what's happening to our treescape. Right. So that says that it's, that it's wise to, to have a whole variety of trees yeah. rather than stick with one tree so that you can uh, Absolutely. have some backup. Um, yeah. How many of the beds in the rose gardens, you haven't mentioned this, are going to be given over to wildflower? Oh, now that's a killer question. Shall I look at Jane for that one? Okay. Yeah. 
Well, we had the opportunity to to trial some ideas really, and we worked with our horticultural apprentices to to look at, at ways of of um, providing more seasonal colour all the year round and a more sustainable way of planting in the rose garden. Um, the current the roses that are there have been suffering from what's it called rose. Yeah, we rose get blight, is it? Called? Yeah, I mean the, the roses are old and a yeah. bit more advanced some of them, and you get replant disease with yeah. the roses. So in order to put them back, we have to replace the soil. So to replant each of those beds, if we want to do it properly, is costing us two thousand pounds. Anyway, we were looking at more um, creative alternatives. And so we trialed those wildflower beds and I believe they've been really popular. I think they look absolutely gorgeous. And we've tried that with both wildflower turf and seeding of annual varieties. And we've also done um, a design for the, um, the entrance way, the narrower piece. Um, we'd love your feedback. I hope you like it. I think the apprentices have done a fantastic job. Um, and we'd like, with a bit of encouragement, to... Um, tackle the whole rose garden but we know that that as it is it's been really popular and valued by friends so we'd really like to to know how people feel about that okay th thank you because at their best uh, the rose gardens have been spectacular in the past haven't they i mean i've got a couple of a couple of questions with regard to the vambra area i mean uh, uh, one is um uh, with regard to the function of, of the yards there what do they do now and if if the expansion is going to take a, a good proportion of that yard uh, where's that where's that activity going to go shall i take that yeah you go yeah um well when when we did the original scheme and we were going to build the learning center and the larger building in the nursery yard we did an assessment of what the contractors actually used and it was less than 50% of, um, of the yard was really used. I mean, you know what it's like if you've got a loft yeah. or, or you've got a garage and you're not putting your car in it, you, you fill it up with, with, with stuff that you don't, I'm not saying junk, but you, you fill it up with the stuff that you don't really have a use for or you'll keep it there uh, and it stays there for years. And that was what was happened to our nursery yard. It was far, far bigger than the contractors needed. Um, so we've rationalised it um, um, and there's, there's plenty of space for us to create new public space and still provide better facilities for the grounds contractor. Right, it's, it's uh, the old adage, use it or lose it. Yeah. Um, now, the expansion of the cafe uh, offering in that region will inevitably lead to increased litter left by thoughtless visitors. And I'm sure there are a lot of people uh, who are thinking on the same lines about uh, it's great to see the park uh, more used, but isn't it distressing to see so much litter? So the question is then what steps can be, you partially uh, uh, address this, uh, Graham, what steps can be taken to deal with this? It's, it, I mean, it, you know, we have to be honest about that and it, it's a real cha challenge and it is something as I said earlier, our, our refuse collections have probably gone up threefold. Uh, probably misrepresented our recycling because our recycling has increased ab above that now that we have separate recycling bins. But it is a real is a real challenge, and the way that people are using the park is changing, and it has changed over the last eighteen months with a younger audience that are coming to the park to eat and have a drink. And you can now dial up uh, Uber delivery on your phone and you if you come around here on a monday morning you will see piles and piles of pizza boxes that have been delivered to people in the park uh, and that's how people are using the park this day, the, 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 these days so it, it is changed so we've got to look at a campaign of behavioral change um, on the whole the vast majority of people do put their rubbish at the bin or they put it next to the bin if the bin is full um, so I don't think the amount of litter um, that we're picking up is increasing, but the litter in the bins completely is absolutely in increasing. And what we, what we need to do is we also need to work with our caterers and we need to say to our caterers, well, do you know what the caterer's best seller is? Bottles of water. So should we really be selling bottles of water? Yeah, 
that, that, that's fountain. something that we need to work on together. And that's one of the reasons why we want more drinking fountains. They, you don't need to buy a bottle of water that creates more, more, more refuse. And a lot of young people are, are very aware of sustainable issues. It's that we've got to work on behavioural change and we know it's not going to be easy. And, and Graham, talking about the, uh, uh, and Jane, the attractiveness of, for the younger people, the, the boating pond. Uh, is it going to be made bigger, smaller? What's the future of the boating pond? So at the moment, we haven't been able to include that um, in the project. Um, we had to make certain decisions about where the money could be spent. Um, we are looking at uh, using a more sustainable way of filling the pond. So we'll be bringing borehole water down from the top of the park to the bottom so that we won't have the, the cost and the unsustainable use of water, um, which costs a considerable amount of money to fill it every year. We know it's really popular. We know it's valued. People love it. Um, we do, we would like to think that at some point, <laughs> I'm going to look at Graham here, that we could um, enhance the ponds. Uh, but at the moment, it's, I think it's easier to say it's not part of the- It's not part of the, the plan. And, plan and having get, get, getting two and a half million of capital from central royal parks, um, it's difficult at the moment to go back and ask for more, but we have got a design and Jane has a design for replacing the concrete um, pond with a natural pond, a permanent natural pond, which would be great from a landscape point of view. You're not gonna have an empty concrete pond for six months of the year. I have better biodiversity value. Um, but the fact is that, we, that, that that comes with a price tag of about £200,000 and we don't have the money at, at the moment. But that's that's that hasn't gone away. Mm, it's an okay, objective. Yeah. And it's, we on the should, wish list. it's on the wish list. And the, the boating lake uh, should be opening at the beginning of July. OK, because it, look, it looks a bit sad at the moment with just a, yeah. a, a little bit of water. Uh, from Howard, uh, the Blackheath entrance to the park suffers greatly from the dismal Duke Humphrey Spur and the coach parking in Charlton Way. Would it be possible to include tackling these ancillary projects in the vision? The answer may well be no, but... Um... Yeah, the, I mean, Duke Humphrey Road is um, a, a Royal Borough Greenwich responsibility. There is a scheme there um, to uh, remove the coach parking from Duke Humphrey Road and make it a pedestrian and cyclist only, and to put in... Um, traffic calming measures because it still is an accident black spot for cyclists. Um, we all need to collectively ask the borough when that's going to happen. T TfL have committed the money, but I don't know the start date. Right, thank you. We, we will wait on for that. And from Nigel uh, Duncan, could you please say something about plans for the Anglo-Saxon Cemetery? <laughs> Yeah, it's one of our first capital. The Anglo Saxon Cemetery is a scheduled ancient monument, um, really important historically. Uh, it's the only example of a Saxon Barrow Cemetery in the London area, and there are only three of that size and quality in the whole country. So it's very, very important. Um, but it is suffering from erosion. And it also does have a tarmac path that goes straight through the middle of it. And in fact, we were looking at it with our archaeologists today, and the tarmac path cuts straight across some of some of the some of the barrows, and they're actually underneath the tarmac. Um, and the proposal is to remove that path. And the reason we feel that we're able to do that, there's another path parallel to it that leads from from um, from the the gate from Crims Hill Gate, yeah. the, the more or less parallel to it. We do think it will probably come back as a, a as a desire line, but it was actually really at the, the, the request of Historic England that we remove that tarmac path and reinstate it back as acid grassland. And that is the proposal for us to do this winter. Okay, thank you. And I'm about to hand you back to Richard, but from Caroline, I'd love to, um, more wildflower beds, please. And the planting in the entrance is coming on well. So it's a, oh, a, a nice comment. And then uh, Richard, back to you. Okay. Right, are there any other questions? Okay, well, look, thank you very much for everyone. Thank you for something like 
something just under 200 people were taking part. Wow. Um, the good news was we didn't charge you for it. The bad news, well, we couldn't give you a glass of wine. But you can go and do that now. And you could raise your glass to Greenwich Park Revealed. Yeah. That's it, folks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.